Hello everyone, in this video I'm going to explain some of the more challenging material for tomorrow's test. Uh, so let's get started. The first one is monomer versus polymer. So when you're remembering the four macromolecules as well as the monomers, please make sure that you're paying attention to which one is actually the monomer and which one is the polymer. Um, but you should be good after that. What is a reactant and what is a product? So if you think about a molecule, there are bonds in it, right? So for example, if this is a molecule, um, there are bonds in between these two atoms, and if this is your reactant, that's what you put into the reaction, what you start with. And during the reaction, you make a product, you break the bond, or rearranging the bond. So in this, uh, in this picture right here, it shows you 2H2 plus O2 makes 2H2O, so you can see hydrogen gas and oxygen gas are two uh, different molecules compared to water, which is formed as a product. And if you were to look at a chemical equation on the left side of the arrow, those are always the reactant, and where the arrows are pointing, those are always the products. So like I said, um, during a chemical reaction, we're rearranging the chemical bonds. So as you can see, we have a chemical bond over here between two hydrogen atoms, um, as well as over here, but right here for oxygen, we have two oxygen atoms being bonded together. But for H2O, you have hydrogen bonded to an oxygen and bonded to another hydrogen. Um, spontaneously, oh, right here. So what type of reaction occurs spontaneously and what type of reaction usually requires a source of energy? Um, if you were to look at these two pictures right here, um, you're going to see at least one of these on the test tomorrow. Um, as you can see on the, the x-axis, is the reaction progress. So you need to make sure that you know how to read one of these graphs, and if you don't, make sure you see me tomorrow. On the y-axis, um, it shows you the potential energy, so how much energy your reactant or product holds. If your reactant is higher than the product, means higher energy for reactant, lower energy to broad for product, that means during this process, you're releasing energy from the reactant to product. You're releasing energy. And if a reaction is releasing energy, so overall, right, from reactant to product, it's releasing energy, and then this reaction is more likely to be spontaneous, which means this reaction can happen on its own without you adding any more uh, energy source to allow the reaction to happen. Uh, this is an energy absorbing reaction where the reactant, what you start with for the reaction, has a lower uh, energy level, and the product has a higher energy level. So in order to go from reactant to product, you have to raise the energy level uh, from the reactant. So that is an energy-absorbing process. So if you think about it, if you're heating up water, for example, that's not a chemical reaction, but water, when you heat it up, uh, the water molecules are moving faster in, in heated water and you're raising the energy level from reactant to product, and when you heat up water, this process requires heat, and it doesn't happen on its own. So the reactant to product, uh, like this, is kind of like water cooling on its own, and it's a spontaneous process, and reactant to product like this requires an absorption of energy, even though water, um, heating up water is not really a chemical reaction, but if that helps you um, remember this. Um, that's good. And what's also important is finding the activation energy um, within one of these graphs. So what is an activation energy, first off? An activation energy is the amount of energy required to allow the reaction to happen. So let's say we have these reactants and we try to make this product. In order to make the product, even if it's a spontaneous process, you still have to have some sort of movement or some sort of molecule movement or energy to allow products to be formed. So this is what the activation energy is. From reactant to product, let's say um, these two molecules has to shake, and it has to shake to a certain extent and have a certain energy before this bond can break. Um, and if you were to look at uh, one of these graphs, the activation energy is this part. So you go from reactant to the highest point of uh, this graph, that's your activation energy, and after this point, um, we can form products automatically. The same thing was this uh, reaction. You have to raise your reactant all the way to here, uh, raise the energy of the reaction all the way to here before the products can be formed. 
All right, next one. What, um, so make sure, if, you, if you're not understanding this, make sure you see me tomorrow morning, okay? Um, next one, what do enzymes, what does enzymes are very specific mean? So you can think of an enzyme as a lock, and you can think of a substrate, which is what the enzyme binds to, as a key. So a lock and a key have to fit each other, right? Certain locks only fit certain key, and enzymes are the same way. You have this enzyme over here that can fit only the substrate to make products. You have this enzyme with a different shape and different active site that can only fit the substrate, even though none of the enzymes of substrates are actually looking like that. But it's a good picture to show you that enzymes are very specific. Log and key, you can only allow a certain substrate to fit in a certain enzyme. It's a one-to-one it's a one-to-one -one relationship, it's monogamous, and then we can form products, okay? Next one is, what are some conditions that enzymes depend on? We have temperature and pH. So um, as we did the potato catalase lab, you saw that at regular temperature, at room temperature, the potato, um, the, the enzyme, enzymatic reaction was pretty fast. So that would be a, around here. And when you boil the potato, um, you didn't see as much bubbles because enzymes denature. Remember the monkey, right? The monkey folded up together. That's your enzyme that has the shape that allows it to work. But at high temperature, this monkey will fall apart. This enzyme, will, this shape will break apart and it will no longer work. So um, here's temperature. Um, so how you read one of these graphs is you have the x-axis and you have the y-axis. And as temperature changes, you can see that the, the activity of the enzyme is different. So at 10 uh, degrees Celsius, the activity is right here. 20 degrees Celsius, um, the, the reaction rate is right here. So at about 38 degrees Celsius, the reaction rate is the highest, that means you have the most amount of substrate that can be turned, most amount of substrate that can be turned into products. Um, so that's called the optimal temperature. So you need to make sure you know what the word optimal means. That's optimal temperature. And then the same thing with pH. pH is how acidic or how basic your solution is. And every single enzyme has a certain optimal pH where it works the best. So for this enzyme, for example, at pH 7, you have the highest rate of reaction. So that's your optimal pH. Your enzyme is functioning the best. You can make um, the reaction go as fast as possible. Um, so this is the picture showing you uh, different enzymes have different pH. So for example, this pepsin works best at acidic environment. Um, the urease uh, works at all of the acidic or basic, but it prefers, it works the best at pH about, about 7, right? And then here we have glycine oxidase um, that works best at a slightly basic pH. So at the highest point, if you go down all the way to here, is a pH about 9. So the optimal pH for this enzyme will be about two, the pH about this of this enzyme, the optimal pH of this enzyme is about 6.5, and the pH optimal pH of this enzyme is about nine. So, at what pH do these enzymes have the same uh, react, same amount of reaction or the same activity? Um, that's where you see where when you see where the graphs inter, intersect. Okay, so these two graph cross crosses uh, right here, and uh, it lands right here. So pepsin and urease have about the same uh, activity at around pH 4.3. And then urease and glycine oxidase have a uh, similar, have the same reaction rate at about pH 8. So you need to know how to read one of these graphs, uh, one of these graphs, and these graphs, okay? And if you have a um, problem reading these graphs, make sure you see me. It's really important that you get um, all of these because they're all going to be on the test. Um, next one. Uh, these material are pretty easy, so we're not going to go over it. Uh, for the vocabularies right here, um, moving on to ecology, you want to make sure that you are very clear about 
these um, these vocabulary because the other ones are pretty easy and I think you already know it. So let's take a look. For individual, individual is one single organism, any living thing. A population is um, are organisms of the same species living in the same area. So for example, you could have a population of goldfish. They're, they're in a group. They all stay at the same place and they, um, they're in a population because they're all the same species. A community, however, is, uh, is larger than population. We're not only considering one species, we're considering all of the species in the same area. So that's a community. And here we have, all right, so, so a community can also be, can be worded a few ways. You can have um, all, the populations in, all the populations in one area. You can have all the biotic factors in the same area. That means the same thing. They bo they're both describing a community. So if I were to ask you, what is the smallest unit that describes a group of species of the, a group of the same species living in the same area? The answer will be population. If I were to ask you, what is the smallest unit that, the smallest description of all of the species that live in the same area? That will be a community. But the community doesn't consider the abiotic factors, only the biotic factors and how they interact with, with each other. The next one is ecosystem. Ecosystem is all of the abiotic and biotic factors within one area. And the next one we have biome. Um, we'll worry about that uh, our, our, next, our next cycle, so we'll skip that. And then biosphere is just the entire earth. So population, community, and ecosystem. You have to be 100% sure you know what the exact definition is. All right, next one. Habitat and niche, you also, these are also two vocabulary that are really important for our understanding of ecology. And you want to make sure that you know this so you're prepared for the test tomorrow. Um, here we have habitat. So a habitat, if you look at this picture, I'm sorry about my hair, I keep on getting in my, in my mouth. Um, a habitat is, an organism's habitat is um, where this organism lives, or a species habitat is where it lives just the location and how, how the abiotic factor is set up. So that's your habitat. A niche is a, much bigger, is a much bigger category, a much bigger description than habitat. It's not just where you live, but also what you do in this environment, uh, how you interact with other members of the same population, how you interact with other, other types of populations, other species, how you interact with the abiotic factors, um, and all that, okay? So your role that you play within the habitat, as well as your habitat, um, that as a whole is called a niche. So here are some other words that you wanna make sure you know uh, on species, interspecific interactions. So interspecific just means inters in between, right? Specific is species, in between species interaction. Um, so obviously herbivore, carnivore, uh, omnivore, you need to know those uh, vocabulary. Um, herbivore is an, 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 an organism that only eats plants. Uh, carnivore is only eat meat and omnivore is eat plant and meat. It's not talking about your decision for example, as a human being, whether you want to eat meat or not, or whether you want to eat vegetables or not, that's your decision. But as a species as a whole, for human beings, for example, we are able to eat meat and vegetables, and we naturally would eat both types. So we're an omnivore, not an herbivore or uh, a carnivore. The next one is competitive exclusion principle. This is um, definitely something that you need to make sure that you know, and it's more of a new concept for most people. So I'll go over it one more time. Competitive exclusion principle means two species sharing, sharing the same niche cannot coexist. That means if two species uh, live in the same area, eat the same food, drink the same water, they would not be able to survive at the same time. And the reason for that is because there's always a limited amount of resources on Earth, unfortunately, so the result is if, you ha if two species share the same niche, you will not be able to have enough resources for one of the species. So one would live and the other one will die. Um, 
as you can see in this picture, in this example right here, these two uh, species of paramecium can live just fine on its own. This is the population size it, it grows, and they're just fine. But if you put the two of them in the same petri dish, one of the paramecium will die, and the other paramecium um, will live on and outcompete this paramecium. So this is competitive exclusion principle. Um, just a really bad way to remember it is um, think about, let's say you were getting dinner at home and your mother only made, or your parent, one of your parents only made a certain amount of dinner and you and your brother are fighting for that dinner. But there's only enough dinner for one person, okay? So what happens is you and your brother, like right here, one is going to get the dinner and the other one's not going to get any dinner. And eventually, um, one of you would just not have dinner. You won't necessarily die, but uh, I hope. Um, but in this case, it's similar to competitive exclusion principle where you're fighting for a limited amount of resources. And the result is one will get it, one will not. The next one is in order to minimize. So this is competitive exclusion principle is about competition. Resource partitioning and character displacement. Uh-oh, I don't have All right. We know that for competitive exclusion principle, one will die, one will die, one will live on. But what if both species, you know, end up living uh, even though they had initial competitions? So what happens is through evolution, those that avoid competition successfully will live on, and the ones that don't will die because there's not enough resources. So for example, right here, this is resource partitioning where all these birds eat the same type of food, but instead of fighting for the same worm, for example, at the same part of the tree and have too much competition and having some species dying, the result is through evolution, these birds end up eating at this part of the tree, these birds end up eating at this, this part of the tree, and so on. Then we no longer, these birds no longer share the same niche that allows them to all live just fine. So this is a result of evolution, and it's a result of minimizing competition between different species. And here we have character displacement. Um, you don't need to know any of this, but character displacement um, is the result of instead of changing where you're getting your resources to minimize competition, you can also change your character so you're no longer eating the same food uh, as you did before. And, you know, this is not you want to change your character and then you'll just change it. It's just it's a result of evolution where those that has a change in character and are able to eat other food that's, that they're not competing with the other species, um, those will live. And eventually, um, the birds will have different characters. So right here, it shows you on these two islands, these birds uh, have the beak depth of about the same and they eat very, uh, very same seas. But on this island, in order to minimize competition as a result of evolution, uh, one bird will have smaller beaks, one bird will have bigger beaks. So they're no longer competing for the same resources. So they both live. And that's a good thing. All right, next one is aposematic coloration, which is right here. So this is aposematic coloration, um, which is just warning color of any kind, any neon color that, um, you know, allows the predators to learn and through evolution to, auto, to uh, even have an instinct for to not eat these species because they have these warning colors. The next one is mimicry. Mimicry is one species mimicking another species so the predator can learn very quickly that this body pattern, this color pattern is dangerous that protects the predator and it protects the prey and this is often um, a result of uh, a predator-prey relationship. So here we have Batesian mimicry, where <laughs> my student said uh, it's a bait, right? So you're setting up a bait. So for example, this one, this this fly, has a very similar pattern, a pattern to a wasp, uh, and a predator would not know which one is a wasp and which one is a fly. So this fly is looks harmless, but is not actually harmless. We call that Batesian mimicry. Malarian mimicry is like malaria, or uh, I don't remember the other word, but bottom line is you look dangerous and you are actually dangerous, you're actually poisonous. So in this case, uh, B, 
and wasp, they can both sting, a sting, and um, that's the difference between Basia and Malaria mimicry. Are we almost done? We're almost done. Um, next one is all of these words. So if you look at a food chain like this, or a food web actually, first off, a food web is different from a food chain because um, each organism can take up more than one uh, trophic level. So for example, if you have a food chain like this, you have to have a producer or an autotroph, it's the same, same meaning, and then you have a primary consumer that is an herbivore, you have a secondary consumer that's an omnivore or, uh, or a carnivore, you have a tertiary consumer that's an omnivore or a carnivore as well, and then you have your apex predator or top predator. Um, so this is one chain. Every single one of these organisms can only occupy one trophic level. So the, remember our pyramid? That's a trophic level. Um, one thing for you to also remember is decomposers can, after all these organisms die or when they, you know, produce weight, the waste, the decomposers turn those large organic material into smaller material and break it down so that um, the matter can be recycled. But if you were to look at this food web, um, we have a more complicated relationship. So for example, we have our producer or autotroph as a plant. And then we have primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer, and top predator. So, so you can have a food chain like this. But you can also have a food chain that goes primary producer, primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer. Oh, I hope I said it right earlier. Primary producer, primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer, right? Or you can have primary consumer, a primary producer, primary consumer, and then secondary consumer. So this shrew right here could be a primary consumer, it could, it could be a secondary consumer, and it could be a tertiary consumer. So they could occupy multiple trophic levels. What you all also notice here, yeah, so you need to be able to follow one of these, you know, follow the food chains and see um, that each one of the, these organisms have the potential of being at more than one trophic level. So how do you know? You just you start right here, primary producer, primary consumer, secondary consumer. That works. Primary producer, primary consumer, secondary consumer, Tertiary consumer. So our hog could be a lot of things um, in the trophic levels. I think that's it. What else? Oh, a heterotroph. Remember, a uh, heterotroph is always a consumer as well. So what that means is that autotroph can produce its own food. So that's the producer as well. Same thing, plant, fungi, some bacteria, uh, uh, phytoplankton. They're, those are all producers or autotrophs. And then if you have a consumer or a heterotroph, those organisms cannot make its own food, so they have to eat other producers or consumers in order to live. Um, you also need to make sure that you know decomposers decomposes things, right? Break things down. Scavengers, uh, those are, for example, vultures. We don't have a picture of it. Anyway, a vulture that eats dead things. Um, so any organism that eats dead um, large dead animals will be called a scavenger. Moving on, uh, next one, phytoplankton and zooplankton. Please make sure you know that phytoplanktons are photosynthetic marine organisms. So they're kind of the plants for the ocean, even though they're not actually plants. Um, so they're, they're autotrophs, they're producers, that's it. And uh, then you have zooplankton, those are tiny tiny uh, fish or shrimps that eat the phytoplanktons. So these are our primary consumer in the ocean food chain, okay? Primary consumer. So they're kind of like the herbivores of the ocean, even though they're not actually herbivores. So if that helps you remember it. Um, when a, a whale filters through the, the ocean, they eat a lot of these zooplankton. Next one, ecological pyramid. We have three different types. There's the energy pyramid, pyramid of numbers, and the pyramid of biomass. 
energy pyramid is how much total amount of energy you have at that trophic level. And the pyramid is an upright pyramid for sure. And every time you move up a step on the pyramid, only 10% of the energy, 10%, 10%, 10% of the energy is actually retained as biomass. So for example, if you were to eat a pound of pizza, um, 0.1 pound of that pizza will potentially become the biomass, the body weight of your body. Um, and you're gaining, you're gaining 10% of that energy. So this is a pyramid of biomass. It's also in an upright pyramid um, that allow you to pass on 10% of the biomass. So the total amount, the total biomass of producers is always way uh, bigger than the total biomass, the total weight of um, primary consumer, which is also bigger than the secondary consumer. Then the next one is pyramid of numbers, since we're now we're counting, we're not talking about energy, we're not talking about biomass. So the pyramid could be could be upright. It could also go like this. It could also have a weird shape. Um, because we're just counting the number of organisms at that uh, trophic level. This one is um, biological magnification. So this is quite important in case you don't remember. Biological magnification. So biological magnification talks about the accumulation of toxins. So for example, mercury. Um, if we release mercury into the ocean, for example, the fish are going to eat it, and when you know the, the really tiny fish are going to eat it first, and then the larger fish are going to eat a lot of those tiny phytoplankton, zooplankton. Eventually, when we eat the fish, the fish already has a lot of toxins built up um, because the toxins don't get don't actually get used, right? Oh wait, that's a uh, wait. But this is this is not the right picture for that um, biological magnification. Here it is. Here here's biological magnification. I'm sorry for that. Uh, right here. So this is biological magnification where you have a built up of toxins. As you can see here, if you have this amount of water, because the plankton use a lot of that water, so the the toxins build up. And then the fish eats a lot of the plankton, so the, the, the toxin will build up even more. And then when we have these uh, birds, they'll have even more toxin. And when we eat the bird, we eat all the toxins. That's biological mag magnification, which is also written right here. So when we talk about accumulated toxins, we're talking about toxins being accumulated as you move, as you move up the energy pyramid. Uh, this is the 10% rule. So 10% gets of and the energy gets passed on to the next uh, trophic level. Most of the other energy get used up as heat or um, used in cells to keep you alive. Uh, we're yeah, we're almost done. So here we have MPP, GPP, and R. And GPP. So first off, GPP is the biggest category. It's gross primary production, which is all of the glucose that plants produce uh, through the photosynthesis. So if you look at this one plant right now, when you see that plant during the day, it's producing gross primary production. It's producing food for itself, and some of those food is left over within the plant body. All right, so gross primary production is all the glucose that it produces through photosynthesis. Respiration is something that's done by all living organisms. Again, I'm going to say it one more time. It's really important. Respiration is done by all living organisms. So what that means is that every living organism, in every single cell, they all need energy. And for a plant, uh, a plant produces all that glucose not to just give it all to you because that's not the purpose of a plant. A plant wants to keep itself alive. So a part of this glucose, a plant will use it um, uh, the, the plant cells will use it to allow um, to allow the cells to use energy and, and live. And then the remaining part, this part, this remaining part will become the plant's body. And then eventually when you eat a plant, or when an herbivore eat a plant, what you're eating is the remaining glucose uh, that's laid down as a part of the plant body. So that's called net primary production. So now we come up with this equation, NPP equals to GPP minus R, which means the leftover is the total minus the part that plants use on their own because plants also need to live. 
The next one is the difference between chemical and physical process. Uh, chemical process, for example, is burning wood. You're turning the chemicals in the wood into something else, and you can see, you know, oxygen being consumed, carbon dioxide being released, all that reactions are happening. So that's a chemical process. A physical process is only a rearrangement of the molecules. There's no breaking or forming the bonds. It's just rearrangement of molecules. So for example, if you have ice melting into water, uh, it's just the water molecules are, are a little bit farther apart. That's what allows um, ice be turned, to be turned into water, but the H2O is still H2O. So that's called a physical process. Last part, water cycle. Transpiration and evaporation are both a part of the water cycle. How are they, how are they similar? How are they different? Um, first off, evaporation is liquid water, liquid water, liquid water, being evaporated into gas uh, water. So when you're breathing in right now, you're breathing in some of the gas water. But when you're drinking, you're drinking liquid water. And if I leave this open, we have evaporation, water, liquid water being turned into gas water. And just something that happens on its own. Um, so that's evaporation. And this could be a biological process and it could be a physical process. For example, if you sweat, you go running and you sweat and the water evaporates from your body and that's, you know, that's a physical process. Um, however, transpiration is evaporation from the leaf. So your leaf, think about a leaf, it has pores on it and those pores are called stomata. You don't have to know this yet. But water will be able to will be able to evaporate from the stomata. So that is called transpiration. And this is a biological process because it involves a plant. And then um, the last part is, do water molecules always follow the same steps through the water cycle? No, we could go like this, we could go like this, we could go this way, you could go all the ways, okay? Um, I hope you find this video very helpful and I hope you'll do really well tomorrow.